Good morning. My name is Bill Farron. I'm a member of Nine O'Clock Church. Uh, it's lovely to join you this morning. We're going to start our meeting together by singing Only a Holy God. Bill. I'm a member of Nine O'Clock Church here and it's lovely to be with you this morning. Wherever here is, it's great that you're here. This morning, we're going to read from God's Word to the Philippians. Uh, we're going to spend time uh, singing and encouraging one another and presenting our prayers before our God. And as well as that, JJ is going to expound the Word of God to us. You know, when someone really sensible speaks, you tend to lean in and listen to hear what they've got to say. They may not necessarily say a lot, but when they do, you lean in and you listen. I find it really difficult to read Philippians without thinking about Paul and Silas in stocks, their backs stinging from the flogging they just got. And not only that, but singing praises and praying to their God. And not only them, but also the prisoners next to them 
leaning in, intrigued and listening to what is going on. And I think too of the jailer and his family in their home, listening and thinking, what is going on here? When someone like that writes you a letter, when someone like Paul the Apostle writes you a letter, you open it up and you read it with great interest because what he's got to say is really important. You lean in and you listen. And I wonder too, in the Philippian church, who it was that was part of that church as they read that letter from Paul. Well, we'd expect it might have been Lydia, the trader. She probably was there. But also maybe the jailer and his family that were there as the church opened the letter and read it. I expect they were reading it with great eagerness. Paul and Silas's astonishing behaviour in the jail caused the jailer and his family to ask the question, what must I do to be saved? That was incredible, wasn't it? And so as we hear from the Philippian letter, we need to lean in and listen with intent. We're also really keen that you might connect with the North Mead Church community. There's a connection card just above the link for online church. If you could fill that out, that would be really great. I'm going to continue on in our meeting now by praying. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for calling us to be your people through the words of the gospel. And we thank you for people like Paul and Silas who, with their actions and joy and endurance, commended the gospel to so many. We pray that as we meet today, we would, encourage, we would be encouraged in the faith, encouraged to live the lives that commend the gospel. In Jesus' name, Amen. Hey everyone, welcome to Kids Spot. My name is Matt and I'm one of the leads at Kids Alive. And I'm here to teach you this week that as Christians, our home is in heaven. And that's what the Bible tells us and what our passage this week from Philippians is all about. And I want to tell you a story about my friend Jake so we can learn what the Bible is telling us. I've got a friend named Jake. He's my best friend. We spend heaps of time together. We get along really well. We like the same things and just always have fun when we spend time together. One week, we thought it'd be fun if Jake could sleep over at my house for a night. So I asked my parents if he could come over and he asked his parents if he could come over for a night. Both our parents said yes. So everything was good to go. So on Friday night, Jake came over for our sleepover. As always, it was super fun. We ate plenty of junk food, had pizza for dinner, and stayed up super late playing games and joking around with one another. The next morning, my mum made us pancakes for breakfast, which was delicious as always. Just as we were finishing our pancakes, Jake's mum was at the door ready to pick him up and take him home which meant it was time for Jake to go home. Jake being over at my house for a little while is good and fun, but it's better for him to be at home with his family. That's where he belongs, back to where his family live. As much as I'd like to think that we are brothers, sadly we aren't, and he has his own family, his own house that he lives in. This story reminds me of what the book of Philippians is teaching us today, that our home is actually in heaven. As Christians, our home isn't here on earth, but in heaven with God. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20 says, But our citizenship, which means where we belong, is in heaven, and we eagerly wait for the Saviour from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. As awesome as it would be for me and Jake to live in the same house so we could spend all our time together, that isn't the case. He can come over to my house and I can go to his house to hang out with him. 
But eventually, we have to go to our own homes because that's our home. And we know that's our home because that's where our family lives. That's where we belong. Just like me and Jake, we all have a home that we go back to. But as Christians, our home that we are waiting to go to is heaven. Our real home isn't here on earth. It is in heaven with God. And we know that heaven is our home in the same way that I know I'm not at my home when I'm at Jake's house. And that's because my family aren't there. Jake being at my house for a little while is good, but it's better for him to be at home with his family. That's where he belongs. Just like our homes here on earth are good, heaven is so much better because it's with God and all his family. And that's and it's forever. We have our family with us here on earth, but God is our Father in heaven that looks after us and cares for us in so many ways. God calls all of us to be a part of his family and to live with him in heaven, where he has made our real home for us. And it will be our home forever. So we all wait for the day when Jesus comes back to get us and to take us to our real home in heaven. So why don't we pray to thank God for this? Heavenly Father, we give you great thanks that you love us and care for us. We thank you uh, that you have made a home for us in heaven. We wait patiently uh, for you to take us there. We pray that we would remember this and that we would be telling our friends so they could be a part of your family too. Amen. I can't wait to see you guys soon. Hi, I'm Stephen Swapley. I attend the 9am service. Today we're reading Philippians chapter 3, verse 12 to 21. Not that I have already reached the goal or am already perfect, but I make every effort to take hold of it because I also have been taken hold of by Christ Jesus. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and reaching forward to what is ahead, I pursue it as my goal, the prize promised by God's heavenly call in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let all of us who is mature think this way. And if you think differently about anything, God will reveal this also to you. In any case, we should live up to whatever truth we have attained. Join in imitating me, brothers and sisters, and pay careful attention to those who live according to the example you have in us. For I have often told you, and now say again with tears, that many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their stomach. Their glory is in their shame. They are focused on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly wait for a saviour from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform the body of our humble condition 
into the likeness of his glorious body by the power that enables him to subject everything to himself. Well, hi everyone. My name is JJ. I'm one of the ministers here at Northmead. Uh, it's great that you could join with us today online. We're going to spend some time now looking at God's awesome word together. But before we do, let's talk to our great God in prayer. So please join with me as I pray. Father, you are good and loving and awesome. You have given us your word, a light for our path, so that we might know you, we not, might know the goodness of your love, that we might know the awesome future that you have in store for us because of what your son did for us on the cross and through his resurrection. Please help us today to look forward to that reality, to strive for that goal. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as a child, I never learned a musical instrument. Uh, we were never particularly a musical family, but I now look at people who are musical and I think, man, I wish I could do what they do. Now, I don't have some secret desire to be a rock star or anything like that, but I just look at people who can take an instrument, enjoy playing it, and maybe even have the potential for other people to enjoy the sound that they make and it just seems like something amazing. Now, whenever I sit in on a band rehearsal at church, uh, and they're all talking about things like harmonies and key changes and turnarounds, pitch and tone, it's a time where I realize I'm the only person in the room who has zero musical talent whatsoever. And often after times like this, I reflect upon that experience, and I think that's what it must feel like to be a muggle at Hogwarts. They've got these amazing magical powers that I just can't relate to whatsoever. And so I can now real, see the real value of learning a musical instrument, particularly as a way for my kids to serve at church in the future. And so three out of my four kids all learn a musical instrument. But I do remember having an interesting conversation with one of them at one point. At one stage, this child was learning the piano and they decided not to continue with it. I said, well, what, why don't you continue and keep going with it? It would be a great skill to have for the future. And they said to me, but I can play it now. And I said, well, yeah, sort of, sort of, but surely you're not saying there's nothing left for you to learn after just a year of lessons. And they said, oh, but I can play it though, can't I? I said, yeah, so there's no room for improvement. You've mastered the piano. And they said, well, pretty much, I can play it and you can't, Dad. Now, in the end, this child had no desire to progress, no desire to get better, which of course just gives away the fact that they just weren't really into, in the, into the piano in the first place. But we can be a little bit like that in our Christian lives. I can think of a situation where people think, well, now I have salvation, so why go further? I know Jesus, so why should I strive anymore? And last week, we actually saw in Philippians, didn't we, just how great it is to be in Christ. We saw how great it is to have a righteousness that is not from our own, that doesn't come from the Lord. It's so good to have confidence in Jesus rather than something unreliable like our own performance. So then some people might think, well, if I'm a Christian, I know Jesus. I'm arrived, haven't I? So why should I strive from this point on? I know this Christianity thing well enough to secure my salvation. What's the point of putting in any extra effort going forward? Well, in a Christian's bad moments, they might start to think this way. Or maybe you know you're not meant to think that way. But nevertheless, you allow yourself just to ease off the effort in your Christian life from time to time. And just sort of coast. But what does that say about us? What does it say about the gospel? Why should we be striving? Why should we be putting in a great effort into our Christian lives? And actually, that's what the second half of Philippians 3 is all about. Paul calls on Christians to do two things. It's about looking forward and it's about looking upwards. At the end of last week's passage in verse 10 and 11, Paul said, 
I want to know Christ. Now, look, Paul already, already knew Christ, but he wanted to know him better and to journey with him in both death and resurrection and to have his life conform to the life of Jesus. Because after all, a true Christian can't say, look, I know Christ, and then not want to know him better. You can't as a Christian say, I've tasted heavenly fellowship with God, and then not want more of it. Now, in the Bible, the Christian life is not depicted like a lounge, but like a road that we walk on. Because the great blessings for us as Christians are ahead. We're not there yet. It takes some effort for us to get down that road to the very end. And so in verses 12 to 16, Paul talks about looking forward and he begins by saying, not that I've already reached the goal or I've already perfected, I'm already perfect, but I make every effort to take hold of it because I've also been taken hold of by Jesus Christ. Now Paul says, I'm not there yet. I haven't yet taken my place in the resurrection of the dead. I haven't yet been conformed fully to Christ. So he presses on and he pursues God's purpose for him. He wants to take hold of that for which Christ took hold of him. I think that's a really helpful way of looking at the Christian faith, taking hold of that which Christ took hold of you. Because Christ has taken hold of us. Our future is secure. We know nothing will snatch us out of his hands because the Father has given us to him. But that doesn't mean we say, well, he's taken hold of me. I'm okay now. Now We should strive to take hold of that which has taken hold of us. And Jesus didn't take hold of us so that we can continue to live our old sinful lives and never change. No, Jesus took hold of us for something much better than the lives we're living now. He took hold of us for perfection and completion of God's purposes. And so that perfection, that future fellowship with God, should be our aim of our Christian lives. Our focus should be forward to better things, to that prize. And that's actually what Paul says in verses 13 and 14. Have a look with me at what he says here. He says, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and reaching forward to what is ahead, I pursue as my goal the prize promised by God's heavenly call in Jesus Christ. You see, Paul is calling for Christians to have a singularity of purpose and ambition in our lives. We should have our eyes only for the prize for which we receive from God. And Paul says that involves forgetting what is behind and reaching forward to what is head. In other words, past Christian experiences are all well and good, he says. But you don't dwell on them when you know they're not not yet the prize. After all, if you were to bow out in a marathon at the 30-kilometer mark, you know, 12 kilometers just short of the finish line, You're not thinking to yourself, yes, I did a really good job. I I got to that 30 kilometer mark. You're going, I didn't make it to the end. I didn't obtain the goal. I didn't complete the purpose of running the race in the first place. Well, as Christians, Paul is saying that none of us have crossed the line yet. There is still more for us to do before we get to the finish, before we get to the prize. But it seems like there are some Christians who have stopped striving. And I can think of people like that in churches that I've been a part of, in in my Christian circles that I've lived amongst. And you can tell because they're just constantly speaking about their past experiences as Christians. You know, they only ever mention their conversion story. They only ever talk about their experiences of their Christian life and fellowship back in the day. Those were the great times. Those were the fantastic blessings in their Christian life. They only talk about past ministries only ever, as if those were enough, and now they're kind of qualified. Or, in cricketing terms, as Christians, they've got a few runs on the board, and so now they can just relax. But Paul says, nothing can be enough for us yet. Not until we've reached that goal, 
that none of us has yet obtained. And then he actually says something quite odd. He says that those who are mature, and the word there, mature, is really literally the word perfect. Those who are perfect will realize they have not yet reached perfection, is what he says. Verse 15, have a look with me. Therefore, let all of us who are mature think this way. And if you think differently about anything, God will reveal this also to you. In other words, people who are mature are the ones who are the hungriest. They are the ones who are chasing the prize the hardest, not living in light of past growth and past blessing, but chasing the blessing that is to come, wanting more of God than what they've experienced so far. See, the basic position of maturity is not that I've arrived, but I want to go further and know more of Christ until that day when I know him fully. And that's how we're to live up to what we've already attained, says Paul. We don't say, great, I've done a 30-kilometer race. That will do. That will live, to live up to that 30 kilometers you've run, really, you've got to complete the final 12, don't you? Because to stop here would be a waste of what you've already attained in the race. After all, if you think the most mature Christians that you know, they're not the ones who are kind of sitting on the side of a mountain like some guru reflecting on past experiences only ever. No, they're the ones on the side of the mountain climbing it with all their might to reach that summit. And I think this is the major difference between Paul and the false teachers he actually wrote against earlier in the passage. The false teachers say, you obtain righteousness by performing well under the law. But Paul is saying, the person who is confident in Christ looks forward to the grace that is coming because they know the best is yet to come and it will be given to them so they trust in Jesus' help to, to help them to look forward, to reach and to strain forward rather than only ever looking back to past performance. Mature Christians are people who chase the grace that is to come, says Paul. Those are the ones who aren't happy to stay where they are. So that's why we strive, because we haven't yet reached the prize. So where to look forward, says Paul. We look forward to that, that goal that is set ahead of us, that grace that is set ahead of us. But he also says in verses 17 to 21, where to look upward. Because looking forward needs to be accompanied with looking upwards. Because what is ahead of the Christian is also upwards for us in heaven. See, too often I think as Christians, our thoughts and our actions are dominated by worldly thinking. Worldly things, worldly wants, worldly desires. And the Bible actually talks about having your anchor set. And the question for us is, is it set on the things of this earth? Or is it actually set on the things of heaven? Where is our anchor set? And this is actually a battle for every Christian. Where is our hope set? Do we belong, does it belong in this world or do we belong in heaven? Where do we see our home? Is it heaven or is it this world? This is the battle. And it actually makes a huge difference to how you live your life here and now as a believer. And it's actually going to be largely affected by who you hang around with, how heavenly or earthly minded you will be. Because I think you notice when a person who is a Christian hangs around with people who really are quite worldly. And you can actually notice the person who hangs around with others who are really mature in their Christian faith. They seem to be growing in an upward fashion. They spend a lot of time, but when you spend a lot of time with those who are focused on earthly, uh, earthly realities, those Christians seem to be going downwards. And Paul talks about this idea of influence and says, you need to choose good influences, including himself. Verse 18, have a look. He says, 
Join in imitating me, brothers and sisters, and pay careful attention to those who live according to the example you have in us. Now, this is not an ego trip that Paul is going on here. But previously in the letter, he's been talking about some ministers who seem to have gotten it wrong. Then there's some false teachers who have everything wrong. And he's saying, stick with me and what I'm telling you. And with Timothy, who gets this heavenly perspective. Paul is saying, focus on those who focus on heaven. Paul is saying, look to me. I'm in prison. I'm not that popular in certain circles, but I focus on heaven. And so he warns them about bad examples in verses 18. Have a look. He says, For I have often told you, and now again with tears, that many live as enemies of the gospel, of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their stomach, their glory is their shame, and they are focused on earthly things. Now, the sad thing here is that he's actually speaking about people who are within the church. He's not talking about outward enemies. He's talking about people who you might be tempted to admire or copy. And it's actually probably a reference to those he spoke about earlier in chapter 3, who want to be clear winners, who want to be able to outperform everybody else, who want to hold their heads high up in church. And Paul says, if you have that mindset, well, then you're an enemy of the cross and you're essentially earthly. Now, here's the thing. I don't think any of those people would have said, you know, I'm an enemy of the cross. I hate the cross. They would say all the right things. But what effect does the cross actually have on them? The cross is actually meant to crucify the connection between the Christian and the world so that we don't care about earthly achievements, whether or not they be religious or secular. The cross is supposed to liberate us from things like legalism and materialism, from any confidence we could put in the flesh. We have been saved for a heavenly prize, and that's what we are meant to be pursuing by faith. So Paul is saying we shouldn't admire other earthly reasons. The cross has opened up a way for us It has opened up the goal, the prize, a new reality. And then he goes on to say that our citizenship is now in heaven. Verse 20, he says, Our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly wait for our Saviour from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform the body of our humble condition into the likeness of his glorious body by the power that enables him to subject everything to himself. See, those verses are all all about where we belong. They're about our identity and our future. We don't belong here anymore if we're in Christ. The cross has cancelled our citizenship on earth. And it's actually created a new citizenship for us in heaven. And so if you're a Christian and you live in this world, then the Bible now describes you as an alien and stranger. You have different values, different outlook, different goals, different community, different everything. The cross should change all of that. And I think this idea of citizenship is tied up with the idea of home. Who you belong with where you belong, and who you are. You know, if you're a Christian, your home, it's not North Me, or Winston Hills, or Toongabby, or Sydney, or Parramatta, or Australia. If you're, a, if you're a Christian, then your home is heaven. That's, what, that's where you belong. That's who you belong with. That's who you are. And actually, Paul says, it's also where you're going. And so our lives here are temporary. And you know what? I, I think the best way to think about this is a bit like a camping trip, you know? Because getting the best part of camping is actually getting home, in my opinion. Because when you get home from camping, you actually get to sit down on a nice chair. You get to use a toilet. You don't have to worry about digging holes anymore. There's electricity. 
you can wash yourself properly, there's a big soft bed to lie in, a fridge full of food, a TV you can enjoy watching, so good to get home from camping. Now, I know that some of you love camping and you don't relate to what I've just said at all, and good luck to you, but I hope you can relate to this reality. When this earthly life is over, and it will be so, it will be so good, says Paul, to get home. And Paul says that our Lord Jesus, he will transform our humble body into the likeness of his glorious body. He's not just talking about our physical body. He's talking about the very nature of our existence in this world. The imperfect life that is so spoiled by sin, that is so short and shallow in many cases, that we can't do what we want for God and we struggle with sin and church and fellowship is imperfect and our lives are flawed. But the heavenly life, Paul says it will be glorious and perfect. And that is our home where we, be- where we belong. Now, many of us would say, like Paul, I am eagerly waiting for that reality. But the challenge for us here and now is to actually live lives that are upwards and not invest in putting our confidence in the flesh. See, do you actually live a life that is upwards? Because if someone were to look at your calendar, how you spend your time, how you, what you spend your life doing or who you spend it with, could they see you're a citizen of heaven because you're living upwards for heaven? Or maybe a little close to the bone or a little more threatening. If someone were to look at your bank statements, what you're spending your money on, would they be able to see you're living upwards, that you're a citizen of heaven? Because, you know, sometimes I feel like we as Christians have this temptation that we need to make the most out of every minute of this life. We need to get the best experiences of everything this world has to offer us. Almost as if we have to try and cram as much fun into this life as possible and then we get to go to heaven, which will be a bit of a come down. So there's all these things that you might want to do. But I think as Christians, we need to learn to say to ourselves, I may never get to go to New York or Paris. I might never get to see the Northern Lights. I might never get to own that perfect home that I dream of in the suburb that I've always wanted to live in. I might never get that relationship I so desire. We have these bucket lists before we die. As if this is our one chance to experience fun and joy and satisfaction. And then there is heaven. Or is the prize of heaven that we could only ever access through Jesus' death and resurrection worth having as our one and all-consuming goal and ambition in life? Is it worth investing everything we have upwards in heaven rather than on earth? Now, if you really trust Jesus, then you have to say yes. Yes, it will be worth it. Yes, heaven will be worth it. Heaven is worth holding out for. So what is the stuff you need to get out of your way on the path to heaven? What are the things you need to learn? What are the areas that you need to grow in? What are the earthly entanglements that are stopping you from living upwards in this life? So my challenge to you and my encouragement to you is to say, is to not say, you know what? I'm a Christian. I've gone far enough. She'll be right. Don't be like my child who says, look, I know how to play the piano. I don't need to strive anymore. Why should we be striving in our Christian lives? Because the bulk of God's blessing is in the future. And so we look forward to the bulk of God's blessing, which is in heaven. So my question is, do you want more of God? Or are you happy with mediocrity in your Christian life? Do you want heaven or are our minds set on earthly things? That is the challenge that Paul has given us today, that we will be Christians who live both forward and upwards.
And let's pray we do just that. Let's talk to God. Father, we do ask that you will be working within us to be people who look forward to the wonderful blessings you have set before us. Help us to be looking upwards to the great blessings you have in store for us in heaven. And we pray that we'll be people who strive wholeheartedly for these things. Help us to realize that we need to say no to certain things in this life and to look upwards and forwards to the wonderful blessings you have given us in your son. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thanks everyone. uh, And I look forward to seeing you all soon. Hello, my name's Robin. I'm from Nine O'Clock Congregation. Please join with me in praying to our mighty God. Father of all mercies, creator of all our comfort and our only help in time of need. We are sorry that in these strange times, we've chosen the easy routes to hold back from promoting your word and forgetting to thank you for our many blessings while living in Australia, being so well supported by services and a caring government at all levels. We thank you, Lord, that our governments have set themselves to protect our citizens of Australia and to care for us. Please continue to look graciously upon us, O Lord. Strengthen us continually by your grace and grow us by your Holy Spirit. Give us true repentance for all the errors of our days and give us steadfast faith in your Son, Jesus, that our sins may be done away by your mercy and our pardon sealed in heaven. We know, O Lord, that there is nothing impossible for you. We ask, Lord, that in this time of COVID-19, that you would lend your protection to us all Give us your wisdom to be obedient to the restrictions we face, to be loving and caring of our fellow Australians, to give them the distance they need to remain safe and give us the diligence that appropriate hand washing requires. And Lord, please reveal to us how we can proclaim the gospel, your good news, despite the limitations upon us. Please, Lord, protect our staff here at North Bean Anglican Church from COVID and the evil one. Please give our leaders and elders your wisdom as to the use of technology with which we are blessed. Please, Lord, protect your workers in far-flung parts from COVID and the temptations of this world. Lord, we bring before you for your favour the young ones we are used to feeding with your word. Please give them opportunities to see Jesus at work in your world. Give them access to our children's services and Jackie and her team so that the love of Jesus will be visible to our children, encouraging them to want to know him more. And dear Father, we ask all this through the mediation of Jesus Christ, your only Son, our Lord and Saviour. Amen. Selflessness and peace, my faith was surely sealed until he rescued me. His pardon for my sin, his bounty for my need, from slavery and shame.
one who calls upon his name, they will be saved, they will be saved. And anyone who calls upon his name, they will be saved, they will be Well, today, we've had a great time. We've heard from God's word as JJ's explained it to us. We've presented our request before our wonderful God. We've sung songs of encouragement to one another. But how will I live my life this week? How will we live our lives this week in order to commend the gospel to others? Paul and Silas, backs stinging, clotted with blood, feet in stocks, lived in such a way that intrigued others. That's probably not our calling this week, but we will have opportunities to live in such a way that we commend the gospel to people so that the letter we write might be open to people who are leaning in and listening with care to what we have to say. I'd like to remind you again that we would love you to be able to connect with the North Mead Church community. Filling out the connection card is great, but there are three other simple ways that you can do that. You can check us on the website, you can make a phone call to the office, or you can send an e email. We would love for you to join us again next week as well. Let me pray as we finish. Merciful Father, we pray that this week you will give to each of us the opportunity to commend the gospel to others through our actions courage to speak that gospel and in your mercy cause others to lean in, to listen and to believe the life-saving good news of Jesus. This we ask in his strong name. Amen. See you next week.